Let's take a look at ticker symbol SPGP, the Invesco S&P 500 GARP ETF. Sounds like an STD. GARP, GARP? Yeah, I got the GARP. What about you? Anyway, all transmitted diseases aside, this is a growth ETF. So if you're looking for a 60% dividend yielding ETF with no risk, first of all, it doesn't exist. But second of all, it's not going to be right here. However, since this fund's inception in 2011, it has returned 370% in capital gains, which is a mind-boggling return, definitely outpacing the overall markets. That's an investment I want to hear more about. Invesco manages this fund. I've coincidentally done videos on Invesco's other popular products, including RSP, which is the S&P 500, but by equal weighting for each position. I'm sure you've heard of the triple Qs, which track the NASDAQ 100, the best innovative companies out there, Triple QM, the same exact ETF with a lower expense ratio, but less trading volume. GARP is a little bit different though. They're going to be tracking, and yes, the index is really called this, the S&P 500 Growth at a Reasonable Price Index, aka GARP. See, it was just an acronym, no need to get yourself tested. So according to the S&P 500 website, the aim here is to assemble a stock portfolio of companies with high quality and value composite scores. So it's combining the aspects that you would look for in growth companies with the aspects that you would look for in value companies. So despite its name, the S&P 500 GARP index only has 75 companies. It has the name S&P 500 in it because S&P 75 was not in use. In order to be ineligible for the index, a company must be part of the S&P 500. Then from there, they're going to be taking a score based on other growth factors such as three-year earnings per share growth, and then they're going to take a look at the value and quality of the company by looking at financial leverage ratios, return on equity, earnings to price ratio, it takes the top 75 ranking stocks on those criteria. No single stock can be more than 5%, and then no sector can be over 40% of the portfolio. The constituents get reselected every June and December, so semi-annual rebalancing. So not exactly actively managed, they just follow screeners similar to SEHD, Skiddy, to pick the best possible companies. Despite this, they still have an expense ratio of 34 basis points, which is actually higher than the triple Qs at 20, and SEHD, which has a super cheap expense ratio of just six basis points. I'm surprised the fee is so high for a non-actively managed fund. Reasons for this could be it's really high turnover ratio, so it's certainly still less expensive than the actively managed ones, especially those that are doing options trading. When we look at the sector allocation, we can see some nice diversification. Compared to the S&P 500, one thing that really sticks out right away is how high energy is in the allocation. 26% in GARP versus just 4% in the S&P 500. Materials is at 2% of the S&P 500, but makes up 13% of GARP. Financials are just 3% of GARP, but 13% of the S&P 500. Interestingly enough, the fund for the year prior actually had financials as one of the largest positions and energy towards the bottom. What a shift in just a year. When investing in this product, you're gonna get a good mix of different sectors, but also more exposure to areas that might be overlooked in other ETFs. The top 10 holdings have a lot of unfamiliar names in here. Number one is not Apple, but Marathon Petroleum Corp at 2.3%. So this is a company that specializes in petroleum refining, marketing, and transportation of those products. And they had $14 billion in free cash flow this past year. The second biggest company is Fang, F-A-N-G, the Diamondback energy company, which obviously invests in the Arizona Diamondbacks, and when they're not doing that and investing in the FANG stocks, but they actually explore for new deposits of hydrocarbon, they have nearly 2 million barrels of oil with petroleum, natural gas, natural liquids just ready to go. The third biggest company is CF Industrials Holding. This is a global leader in manufacturing of hydrogen and nitrogen products. They had $3.5 billion in free cash flow last year. Not going to go through all of these, but clearly they have a lot of energy, utility, and tech companies in here. When companies like Apple and Microsoft are pushing that $2 trillion market cap territory, one can possibly make the argument that these might not necessarily be the best growth stocks in the future. 
With SPGP, you're constantly getting your companies benchmarked and filtered for their growth potential and making sure they're also at a fair value. Plus, the S&P 500 criteria ensures that no garbage penny stocks or speculative plays get thrown in here. We see here in their fund characteristics, they have a return on equity that is a blistering 45%. ROE measures how profitable a company is in relation to its shareholders' equity. It tells you how efficient management is with the company's money. Energy companies typically have a high ROE because they often use capital-intensive operations for oil and gas exploration, and that could lead to higher returns when those assets are utilized correctly. If we compared GARP to the S&P 500 since their inception, in June of 2011, SPG has outpaced the overall market, 14.63% average annualized return to the S&P 500's 12.9%. A $10,000 investment in GARP would have grown to nearly $56,000 today. However, it does trail the triple Qs with a super juicy return of 18.29% annualized so while it did better than the market these past 12 years, it has still trailed the always solid triple Qs. However, just because the triple Qs did better in the past doesn't mean that they're going to do better in the future. The 2010s decade had some ridiculously low interest rates for the vast majority of it, and big tech companies just dominated. I'm doubting that dominance will continue this decade when they're already so large in size. I doubt we're going to see that in the 2020s decade. SPGP, of course, pays dividends, not the highest yield, just 1%, but we can see over the years, it does generally go in an upward direction. Just remember, since the constituents of this fund are changing quite often, it's not always going to be the same dividend-paying companies making up the fund, hence why the dividend is so volatile. The fund also has a 5-star rating on Morningstar. This fund is more for those who want growth, capital appreciation, and want it at a reasonable price. This is one of those investments where we can just set it and forget it, and in 20 years, the wealth will have grown. It's a way to mint some more money. Still not sure if this is better than the triple Qs, but as we saw, it's a totally different ballpark of stocks and sector allocations, so different type of diversification. I used a lot of Invesco products to be able to beat the market this year. Check out my Patreon to see my full portfolio. Check out the Patreon to see my full six-figure portfolio where I share my weekly trades. Welcome to the newest Patreon, Robert, who now gets access to my full portfolio. Shout out to Sir Friendzone for the video idea. My videos are always found in podcast form under the Collect Cash podcast name. And make sure you're also leaving a five-star rating if you're listening on podcast. And I'll catch you on the next one.